From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Video surfacing on social media shows what appears to be a possible tornado touching down in Arizona today. And storm chances still in play after an active day across the valley and the state. I'll break down all the details coming up in just minutes. We'll also take a closer look at how people's thoughts on climate change have shifted over the past five years. And eSports eyes strain why gamers may need to start stepping away from the screen more. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Matthew Roy. And I'm Jennifer Alvarez. Thanks so much for joining us. Our big story tonight, a possible tornado touching down in New River. This incredible video shared with us shows the weather phenomenon in action. There's no word yet on any damage or injuries. And here's a wider look at the storm cell. At more isolated, are possible th more tornadoes are possible throughout the day. Other parts of the valley are getting hit with severe flooding as well. Maricopa, Maricopa County tweeting out this GIF saying, make sure you're prepared and don't be this guy. Mike shared this video of the storm drains keeping busy in the East Valley. And check out this Home Depot underwater at Crimson and the 60. We have full team coverage headed your way. Marcella is going to give us a live look behind the scenes when storms strike. But first, let's go to Jordan Evans with what's happening right now. Thank you, Jenny. In fact, you're right. On social media, videos have been surfacing of the possible tornado that touched down in New River okay. earlier this afternoon. Yeah. So I want to take you to radar right now. Let's give you an update on what's happening. Thankfully, the tornado threat has actually diminished for the state. As you can see, the dust is actually the issue we are concerned about as we head you down to the south. So let's take a look down there. We've actually got a brand new dust storm warning that has just been issued by the National Weather Service office there in Tucson. A wall of dust has actually been observed just south of Casa Grande, and it is making its way south. Uh, there along I-10 towards Tucson. So remember to pull aside and stay alive. Do not be driving in that dust storm as it is going to be reducing visibility quite a bit. Up to the north, we've got some showers and thunderstorms moving away from Payson up along the 260 towards the New Mexico state line. And a little bit further out to the west, we've still got some flash flood warnings that are in effect until the evening hours tonight. And actually another thunderstorm is going to be tracking here in the Black Canyon City within the next half hour or so. So we could see some more heavy rains come up here in just a minute. But here's the big picture. All these areas shaded in purple. That is a severe thunderstorm watch that still remains in effect until the evening tonight, which means any of these spots could still see severe thunderstorms later this evening. We're talking hail, wind, flash flooding, and lots of lightning. But we're going to be tracking all these details for you in just minutes in your full forecast. With parts of the valley at risk for flooding, Maricopa County Flood Control is expecting to be hard at work all day and even into the evening hours as more rain is predicted to hit our area. Cronkite News reporter Marcella Bayado headed over to the county's flood alert center to see how their meteorologists are preparing. Marcella? We went behind the scenes today with their staff to see how they're keeping up with the severe weather we've been seeing here today. For meteorologists here at Maricopa County Flood Control, today is a busy day. With all the recent storm activity, flooding is one of the biggest concerns. These radar maps help the alert center staff locate the areas in the valley which run the risk of flooding. One of their main responsibilities is to monitor their alert network, which is made up of weather stations, rain and stream gauges. This helps them in knowing how much rain is actually falling in different areas of the valley. There are over 400 of these gauges and stations spread across the entire county, all providing life saving data, informing meteorologists like Daniel Hens where flooding may occur. We take that information and we let uh, other municipalities know okay, these roads need to be closed. Maybe this neighborhood might need to have evacuations or this particular dam or basin is filling up with water. Uh, someone might need to go out and take a look at that. Those people who are sent to go and take a look at possible dams that are at risk of flooding can be called into work at a moment's notice when the valley sees a surge in storm activity like today. People that work that specialize in dam safety uh, GIS, our operations and maintenance staff that actually will send out to the dams and basins to monitor. All those folks will actually get notified. They come in and we actually, like I said, set up our operations center um, and it kind of grows upscale. 
Hens did also mention that if they continue to see the amount of rain pouring into the valley that we saw this morning, they will need additional staff in order to keep up with the workload. Live in downtown Phoenix, Marcel Bayeto, Cronkite News. For continuing coverage of the monsoon storms today, follow us on Facebook and on Twitter, and find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. World leaders are gathered in New York City today for the United Nations Climate Action Summit to discuss plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. The meeting happened on the same day we learned Arctic sea ice shrank to 1.6 million square miles for the annual summer low. It's the second lowest mark on record. Meanwhile, at the UN Climate Summit, China criticized the U.S. for pulling out of the 2015 agreement, and Russia announced it had ratified the pact, which it had signed already. Now, the last five years has seen a noticeable shift in where the American people stand on climate change and climate action. And you might find some some newfound opinions in some unexpected places. Last fall, the Yale program on climate change communication created maps that show how Americans' climate change beliefs, risk perceptions, and policy support vary. 61% of people across the U.S. are worried about climate change. I talked with some people who took part in Friday's youth, youth climate change strike in downtown Phoenix to get their thoughts on climate change. Climate change is going to impact everyone. It's going to impact the poor, the rich. Obviously, a lot of poorer, marginalized communities are going to be impacted at a much quicker rate, but everyone will eventually feel the effects of climate change, and it's really important that we stand up to it and make a difference. That everything else, by comparison, is going to almost be meaningless if we don't come to terms with climate change. And we need to take action now, and we have to do it for for our children uh, for, and for future generations to come. Uh, we need to think about 30 more years, 50 years more. So when researchers asked people how worried they are about global warming, 60% of people in Arizona say they are concerned. But let's break that down by county. In the most populated county in Arizona, 59% of people report they are worried about global warming. That's right on par with the national average. If we head south to Pima County, we see that 69% of people are concerned with warming, and that's actually about 8% higher than the national average. Finally, if we take a look up to the northwest, Mojave County reports that only 50% of people are concerned with global warming, and that's down 11% from the national average. Live from the studio, I'm Melanie Porter, Cronkite News. So now we want to hear from you. What's one thing you're trying to do to reduce your impact on the climate? Just go to our Cronkite News Facebook and Twitter feeds to join in on the conversation and share your thoughts with us. When Arizona schools opened their doors this fall, 21% of teaching jobs had not been filled. And close to half of the teachers who were on the payroll did not meet state certification standards. That's according to a new survey of state school systems by the Arizona School Personnel and Administrators Association. As shocking as those numbers are, they're actually an improvement over last year. The report comes just 18 months after massive teacher walkouts under the Red for Ed movement. Those sparked increases in the teacher pay and plan to forgive college debt for education students who stay in, to, who stay in the state to teach. In response to the report, State School Superintendent Kathy Hoffman said that while there have been modest improvements, much more needs to be done to attract and retain qualified teachers. A high school football coach allegedly did the unthinkable, sharing information that would hurt his team and help opponents. As Cronkite News reporter Anthony Totry reports, it's a choice that could have long-lasting impact on the players well after they play their last football game. I just feel like you robbed not only my son, but everybody else's son. Davy Jacobs is talking about former Mountain Point assistant football coach Justin Hager, who once coached her son and allegedly sent emails containing strategic information to opposing schools. In Arizona State professor Eric Legg, whose research focuses on the impact of coaching on youth development, says the consequences of Hager's actions go well beyond the football field. Now you've sent this message that you can't trust adults. <laughs> um, so I think it's going to hamper those athletes' interactions with future adults. Um, and then the other one um, is you've sent a message that this type of behavior is okay. 
With that said, it's not just Mountain Point athletes affected. Leg also believes it's important to hold accountable those who received the information and didn't report it. We need to be clear that no, that's not okay either. I mean, we need to take a stand against it. We don't receive information, even if we had nothing to do with it. Uh, we don't receive information in an unfair way. At Friday's game, Mountain Point's first since the allegations surfaced. The focus was on trying to return to normalcy. The seniors have really stepped up to, to try to focus and make an emphasis on, you know, this says we can't do anything about the past, we got to move forward. Mountain Point's parents typically put on meals for the players, but last week they took it a step further with inspirational messages, goodie bags, and a nacho bar in an effort to help the kids get past the issue. I was really amazed by not just the effort that the parents put into it and, and how positive the energy was around it, but you could tell the players were really soaking it up. Yeah, they were really feeling it. As the storm settles and the Mountain Point program aims to get the taste of an odd and unfortunate situation out of its mouth, the team hopes its return to the field is a step in the right direction. In Chandler, Anthony Totry, Cronkite News. Coming up next on Cronkite News, the push to bring technology to tribal areas and empower people on native lands. And the best times to book your holiday flights revealed right after the break. Cronkite Noticias is the Spanish-speaking division of Cronkite News, covering topics such as economics, education, sustainability, immigration, and border relations. Cronkite Noticias strives to serve the Spanish-speaking community in Arizona. Under the guidance of prominent Spanish-speaking professionals, students at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism develop content for our broadcast partner, Univision, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Explore Cronkite Noticias at cronkitenoticias.azpbs.org. Stay in the know, on the go. At Cronkite News, we work hard to report the facts and keep you updated, whether we're on set or on the scene. Taking it from the studio to the field. So I'm here in South Phoenix. In Phoenix, we're just a click away. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. I would never have felt I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. We built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. Wireless access is something most of us take for granted. We shop, we search, you may even be watching this show on a mobile device. But in rural areas, particularly tribal areas, broadband access can be spotty when it's available at all. That problem was the topic of a meeting today in Washington, as Hannah Ehrlich reports from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. One speaker at today's National Tribal Broadband Summit said access to reliable high-speed broadband is an important equalizer for rural areas. But access in those sparsely populated areas continues to be a problem, which is why the government is stepping in. Federal Communications Chairman Ajit Pai touted a 10-year, $20 billion program to help service providers reach those remote areas. The FCC recently launched my proposal to create a $20 billion reverse auction to connect homes and small businesses. We are calling this our Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. The plan continues an Obama-era program. Under the so-called reverse auction, companies submit bids to provide service, and the FCC awards funding to help those with the lowest bids deliver it. White House official Doug Holscher told the summit audience that access to broadband is an important way to empower citizens and to be an equalizer for communities across the country. It's also about improving uh, government services and public safety, and that's a very important thing for every community across our country, and broadband can help be, uh, again, an important equalizer. 
Pi stresses the need for broadband, which can help deliver medicine and health services to Native communities that might not otherwise have them. If you can't find a specialist in your community, telemedicine or telehealth might be one of the best ways for you to get the care that you need. But that requires, of course, a broadband connection. And that's what our rural health care program is designed to address. Today's meeting included breakout sessions with tribal officials and representatives from the FCC Interior, Education and other departments. The two-day summit concludes tomorrow when Arizona Senator Martha McSally is scheduled to be the keynote speaker. In Washington, Hannah Ehrlich, Cronkite News. With more and more people moving to Arizona from California and other states, places to live are in high demand here in the Valley. But an increasing population isn't the only reason, according to a report by the Arizona Multi-Housing Association and the National Apartment Association. Millennials seem to be staying up in apartments longer, and more baby boomers are becoming attracted to the apartment lifestyle. The report revealed that by 2030, Phoenix will need at least 150,000 more apartment units. Well, the first day of fall is here, and apparently this is the best time to start planning those cold weather trips. According to AAA, the ideal time to buy air travel for Thanksgiving and Christmas begins Wednesday. But you need to move fast. By Halloween, most of the good deals will be over, and flights will start filling up as travelers rush to make those reservations. While there's no absolute guarantee to make sure that you're getting the best prices available, being flexible with travel dates can help. For Thanksgiving, fly on Monday, November 25th, or Thanksgiving Day. And Christmas is similar. Flights on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day are traditionally the cheapest. Also, watch out for hidden fees like checked bags. Those can really impact costs. After the break, how air pollution could be affecting babies who are still in their mother's womb. I'm Matt Berry, ESPN Sports Center anchor and graduate of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. With its bachelor's and master's degrees in sports journalism, the Cronkite School is preparing the next generation of sports journalists to tell stories that matter, stories that excite, inspire, and inform. Cronkite immerses students in covering sports at all levels in one of the country's top sports markets. It's this hands-on experience under the guidance of award-winning sports media veterans that shape the top journalist of tomorrow. For the second week in a row, the number of measles cases in the U.S. remain the same. This according to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Two new cases were reported to the CDC last week, but two other cases were determined to be false alarms. That means the total number of cases in the country remains the same. So far this year, 1,241 cases have been confirmed in 31 states. The majority of those were among people who were not vaccinated. New tonight, air pollution may be able to breach a pregnant woman's placenta and enter her womb, directly reaching the fetus. That's according to a study published by the scientific journal Nature Communications. Researchers found when pregnant women breathe in black carbon pollution, harmful particles can make their way from the lungs to the placenta and could potentially affect the vulnerable fetus upon birth. Black carbon pollution comes from fossil fuels, which can come from cars or power plants. The study also suggests the more black carbon the women were exposed to during pregnancy, the more the pollutant was found in the placenta. And researchers say this proves that placentas aren't impenetrable barriers. Well, Jordan, it seems like Phoenix has been an impenetrable barrier to rain. So <laughs> what's been going on today? 
Well, actually, today has been the opposite of that. In fact, downtown Phoenix, we've actually managed to pick up about 0 0.07 inches so far. That's officially what Sky Harbor is saying. But to the north of that, I mean, we're talking crazy amounts of rain, as we saw in the East Valley earlier. Lots of flash flooding out there. But let's take you to it right now. In fact, here's Casa Grande. They actually had a wall of dust just moved through there about an hour ago. And things have quieted down there for now, but we could still see more storm chances down to the south near Casa Grande. But let's talk about temperatures here for a minute. How about this? This is what rain does to our temperatures. We are talking about much cooler than where we should be this time of year. In fact, look at the high country. 47 in Flagstaff. Normally, it should be in the 60s this time of year. 50s for Sedona and Payson. In the Valley, we have actually managed to climb up into the 80s. But if we don't crack 90 today, this will be our first day of maxing out only below 90 degrees since May 28th. So pretty interesting there. If you stepped outside today and you felt this humidity, you are not wrong. In fact, all these green shadings here, that is the oppressive humidity. In fact, we saw these numbers in the 70s earlier this morning, which is about readings what we would see coming out of South Florida. So pretty interesting to see that. We are tracking some activity still. Again, there's that dust storm that I talked about earlier. It is still making its way down to the south towards Tucson, and it is impacting portions of I-10. So remember that if you were traveling down there. Another cluster just to the west of that, and we've got some more rain showers to track for you along I-40 up towards Winlow and Holbrook. Not a lot of those are severe, but are still dropping some heavy amounts of rain. To the west of the valley, we've got another storm complex. This is the next area we're going to be watching over the next several hours to bring our next round of storm chances here in the valley. And I'm actually going to bring this up for you. This is actually really interesting. We are seeing a little bit of rotation begin to happen in this storm. This is just to the west of the Palo Verde nuclear plant, and this is tracking towards the north towards I-10. So if you look up in the sky and you see a little bit of swirling in the clouds, well, you're not wrong. We're actually picking some of that up on Doppler radar, hoping that does not touch down because then we would have another tornado warning to talk about for today. A little bit further to the north along the Colorado River Valley, we've got a severe thunderstorm warning out there until about 5 o'clock tonight, just south of Bullhead City, and a flash flood warning continuing for that place as well. So a lot of areas to track for you across the state. All these areas shaded in purple are expected to see severe weather later tonight. We can take you through future casts and show it to you because the Storm Prediction Center is going to keep us under that slight risk for the rest of the day. In fact, our next round here in the valley. I think it will come through here within the next hour, even closer to midnight as well, and then it will clear out as we get through the overnight hours and still be impacting parts of Tucson for the morning. So as we talk temperatures for tomorrow, you know, a little bit cooler down to the south with 70s down there in Tucson and Phoenix as well. We are going to see those 80s out to the west up and down that Colorado River Valley, or 90s, I should say. But how about this? We're talking 60s and 70s up in the high country, too. And for the seven-day forecast, you know, we're going to keep those rain chances with us all the way into Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. How about that? Sunshine. You know, Matthew, we're finally drying things out as we get into next week and into the weekend. So, you know, as long as we get through the next couple of days here, I think we're going to have our pool weather back here in the Valley of the Sun. I'm looking forward to breaking out the hoodies, so I hope so. <laughs> cool. Up next, the rising trend in video gaming injuries. Why it may be time to walk away from the screen and give your eyes a break. All of its children had come to the Mother Church of Country Music. It was almost like a badge of honor that you had to uh, bring your culture with you to the table. That's why Bob Wills and his guys brought us Western music. That's why Hank Williams brought the South with him from Honky Tonks. Johnny Cash brought the Black Lamb Dirt of Arkansas. Bill Monroe brought music out of Kentucky bluegrass music. Willie Nelson brought his poetry from Texas. Patsy Cline brought her heartache from Virginia. I mean, it, it was the most wonderful parade of sons and daughters of America that brought their hearts and their souls and their experiences, and it gave us a great era in country music. On the next Arizona Horizon, New York Times lawyer David McCraw joins us for a conversation about his new book, Truth in Our Times, inside the fight for press freedom in the age of alternative facts. It's on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, movie star and mogul, Brad Pitt on his work on and off the screen. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. The world of esports is one of many opportunities. Opportunities to compete, 
to hang out with your friends and possibly win some money. But with those opportunities comes a cost. Esports reporter Eric Ruby dissected the risks associated with the rewards. Sometimes esports isn't all fun and games. Extended time in front of a screen and exposure to blue light rays, a type of high energy visible light, can lead to intense eye strain and eye problems. Blue light exposure is uh, associated with macular degeneration, so eventual significant uh, uh, effects on your central vision. It's hard to say how much exposure for how long causes damage, but everybody's eye is uniquely different. According to Dr. Factor, a good way to keep your eyes healthy is by limiting the amount of blue light rays that your eyes take in. While there are options to limit blue light rays during screen time, like protective glasses and software, pro Overwatch player Ashley Trill Powell believes there's another simple way to keep yourself healthy. You definitely need to take breaks, without a doubt. Like, like there's, there is people who are just like machines and they can just like play the game 24-7 and just grind, which is like, if it works for them, sure, like that's completely fine. But like, for me personally, I definitely like, like taking breaks. But eye strain isn't the only health concern esports athletes have to be wary of. Along with maintaining their physical well-being, many esports organizations have also put a focus on players' mental health. ASU CSGO captain Tyler Vore is planning on emphasizing maintaining a healthy mind state to his team this year. It's just so important to be open with your family and your doctors about how you're feeling. Everyone talks about how esports is, oh, you're not an athlete, but there's so much mental strain when you're putting anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day in front of a computer on a game. It's not just, you know, playing a game for fun. You're really working and putting in the time, and that can have a big, you know, effect on just your emotions and how you're feeling. And so I just think it's really important that we at least talk about it. The esports world continues to evolve, and the effort to educate and protect its members will evolve right along with it. In Phoenix, Eric Ruby, Cronkite News.